Hello again. Last week I spoke on how the God we serve is the God of second chances, and third and fourth and so on. But as Yogi Bear would say, the game ain't over till it's over. I made the point that no matter how badly we have messed up, no matter how far we have fallen, God still reaches down to us. He reaches out his hand to us and invites us to stand and to carry on in his strength and with his blessing. In my message, I mentioned how we need to ignore Satan, the accuser of the brothers, the father of lies, who tries to tell us that we're not good enough and that because of our failure and weakness, God can't use us. Today, I want to pick up on that thought a little bit more and explore what God does say about us and who we are in Christ. Because if you or I are going to effectively live for Jesus in this world, we need a good understanding both of whose we are and also who we are. That is our identity in Christ, the one who loves us so. Before I get to that, please listen to our opening song as it talks about God's deep, deep love for us. The words will be on the screen as Carol plays, uh, should you choose to sing along. in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Well, as I said before the song, it is easy for us to buy into Satan's and the world's definition of who we are, that we're worthless, that we're of no account, whereas God says to us that we have infinite value. Sadly, it seems to me that many Christians don't understand their identity in Christ, and so they live defeated lives. Whereas those who do understand and embrace their identity in him find their lives profoundly changed. As I say, God declares that you and I have infinite value. That is the message of the cross, loud and clear. You and I may be unworthy. We certainly don't deserve God's grace. That's the definition of grace. We don't deserve it. But by dying for you, Jesus imputes great value and worth to you. So unworthy, yes. Worthless, not at all. 
because God places value on you. He says that you are worth dying for. So if you today doubt your worth, let me assure you from the get-go that the all-powerful, eternal God of the universe loves you infinitely. And that's why God sent his Son to die for you. And when you accept his death in your place, you become his prized possession. And though you may not always see yourself that way, you need to understand that as his prized and much-loved child, he sees you as having incredible potential. That's really the one point I want to make today. Through the prophet Isaiah, God says, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, for I am the Lord your God, your Savior. In Luke 10, Jesus tells his followers to rejoice that your names are written in heaven. The question is, do we fully grasp the meaning of those truths? As Christians, do we really see ourselves as those whom God has chosen as his very own, as his much-loved children? Jesus says in John chapter 8, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And that, of course, includes the truth of, of who Jesus is, the way, the truth, and the life, as he says later. It also includes the truth that he has set us free and made us his own. And that truth that truth is what gives you and me the wherewithal to live victorious lives. As I've already said, Satan is always attacking. He goes around like a roaring lion, Scripture says, seeking those that he can devour. Speaking to that, Neil Anderson would say that the power to withstand the devil comes from knowing and remembering who you are in Christ, which is why I want to bring this message today. See, if you have accepted what Jesus did for you on the cross, and that is the first step to victory. If you accept his death in your place, then God, the sovereign Lord of the universe, happily sees you as his. As I've already said, he sees the incredible potential that is you. And he makes it possible for you to reach that potential in the power that he provides. You know, over the years, Carol and I have had a few houses. On more than one occasion, Carol has convinced me to buy a house that needed more than a little TLC. She did so because she saw the potential in it. I needed a little more convincing. But I'm not totally dumb. I know enough to trust her instincts and her insights. And when we did go for it, it was amazing as we made the changes, some substantial, some cosmetic. It was amazing how those houses were transformed. As I say, Carol saw the potential when I couldn't always. You know something? That is exactly what God does with those who come to him. He looks past the junk because he knows our potential. He knows what we're meant to be, created as scripture says in the image of God. He knows that, and though sin has marred that image, I want to tell you today that God is in the business of renovation and restoration. Renovation means to make new. If you placed your trust in Jesus, then he has begun a new work in you. That's what 2 Corinthians 5.17 says. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Last week I referred to Isaiah 43. That's the portion in which uh, God speaks of the new thing that he is doing. Friends, you and I are part of the new thing that God is doing. And that doesn't mean that we're a finished work. The old bumper sticker is right. God hasn't finished with me yet. But he is fashioning you into something beautiful, for his glory. So what does it mean to be God's new creation? For a start, it means that you are not the person you were before you committed your life to Christ. Your old sin nature and mine has been nailed to the cross, and we've been raised, as Romans 6, 4 says, to walk in newness of life. Oh, I know the old sin nature crops up every now and then, uh, and rears its head. But friend, you have the victory as God's new creation with his indwelling Holy Spirit to empower you to overcome all that this world throws at you. So when the enemy stuff swirls around you and threatens to pull you down, don't forget that you're a new creation of the one who created the entire universe. Another scripture, 1 Peter 1 verse 23 says, You have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. Now, I know some people, even Christians, don't like the phrase born again. It's been misused by some. 
but it is still a biblical truth. Jesus told Nicodemus that that was the way to eternal life. You need to be born again, he said. See, the point is, you have the new life of Christ in you. As 1 John 5.18 says, you have been born of God. And it goes on to say that therefore Christ keeps you safe and the evil one cannot harm you. Friend, are you living in that reality today? Staying with this theme of our standing as members of God's forever family, consider Ephesians 5, or sorry, Ephesians chapter 1, in which Paul writes of our adoption into the family. He predestined us, he says, to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. In other words, God had his eye on you to make you his from the very beginning. And when you accepted what Jesus did for you on the cross and, and placed your trust in him, you stepped into that relationship that he had waiting for you. And how amazing is that? To be adopted into God's forever family. The term as it's used here is a legal term. You have status you have standing as God's own child. That, in fact, is what John says in the opening verses of the gospel that bears his name. Referring to Jesus, he says, to those who believe on his name, he gives the right to become or to be called children of God. Another scripture, Colossians 3, says you are also God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. Are you feeling down today? Know that none other than God himself has chosen you to be his. Romans takes that further, calling us joint heirs. Now, if we are children, it says, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs or joint heirs of Christ. Mind-boggling as that is, you and I share in Christ's inheritance. It's what chapter 1 of Colossians calls the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. And friends, it is nothing that you or I have earned. The verse says the Father has qualified you and me to share in that inheritance. Understand that qualification has nothing to do with our merit and everything to do with what Jesus has achieved for us. As a Christian leader named William MacDonald once said, when God saves someone, he instantly bestows on that person fitness for heaven. That fitness, he says, is Christ. Nothing can improve on that. Not even a long life of obedience and service here on earth makes a person more fit for heaven than he was the day he was saved. Our title to glory, he says, is found in his blood. Nothing can improve on what MacDonald calls our title to glory. And that means Satan, the father of lies, can't say you haven't done enough. That is so freeing. So freeing. So we are God's own, chosen by him, born again, adopted into his family, and joint heirs with Christ. We're also forgiven. Ephesians 1 verse 7, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of his grace. Colossians says the same thing. That means we are free from condemnation. Therefore, says Paul, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. In crystal clear language, the Bible says there is absolutely no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ. None. Zero. Not even a tiny bit of condemnation to sneak in. No room for it. It's not going to happen. Listen, if God doesn't condemn us, why would we listen to Satan who says you're not good enough? You can't possibly aspire to heaven. God says you can through Christ. And he says you are of infinite worth. There are a whole lot of other words that describe our standing and, and thereby define our identity. Words like redeemed. Redeems, redeemed refers to the payment made to buy us back. Galatians says that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is, who is hung on a tree. Friend, you have been bought with the precious blood of Christ. You are redeemed, and the price paid for you was infinitely high. I've always loved the story of the little boy who made a sailboat from one of those model kits. He spent weeks putting it together. Uh, when he finally had it finished, he was so pleased. He took a marker and he, he put his initials on, on the bottom of the boat. 
A few days later, he was playing with it in the stream near his house when the current swept it away. Sometime later, he was walking in town with his mother and he walked past the second-hand shop and he saw his boat in the window. He ran in and he said to the owner, that's my boat. But the owner pointed out, he told him, he said, there's a price tag on it. He would have to buy it. Whereupon he, the boy raced home and he broke open his piggy bank. Uh, gathering all his money, he returned to the store, plunked it all down on the counter and received his boat in return. As the little boy left the store, he kept repeating, little boat twice mine, how I love you. Little boat twice mine, how I love you. His father heard him saying that as he entered the house. What do you mean, little boat twice mine? asked his father. It's twice mine, he said, because once I made it and once I paid for it. Friends, that is exactly what our Heavenly Father says. He created us, but then we rebelled against his kingship. We alienated ourselves from God. We were hopelessly lost. But God didn't give up on us. Instead, as the hound of heaven, he, he pursued us and paid the ransom through the blood of Christ that we could be adopted into his family. Which is why he can say, twice mine, how I love you. I made you, and then I pay for you. Friend, you are redeemed. You're also justified. Romans 5.1 says that. We have been justified through faith and have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. To be justified is to not only have the penalty of our sin removed, but also to be declared righteous through our trust in Christ's sacrifice. God, the righteous judge, declares you and me to be righteous. Not just that you've served your sentence, but rather that the record is then wiped clean. No more guilt. It is washed away in the blood of Christ. Which is why some suggest that an easy definition of justified is just as if I'd never sinned. That's because on the cross, as Second Corinthians says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That is also part of your identity as a believer. <clears throat> Another word that describes our identity is delivered or rescued. That's what Paul tells the Colossian Christians. He, that is God, has delivered us, some translations say rescued us, from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. See, before coming to Jesus, we were slaves to sin and slaves to our sinful nature. Now we're set free. Again, to quote the Lord, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We're also overcomers. John writes in his first letter that everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. <clears throat> we don't need to live in defeat. In other words, we are victorious. We are victors in the midst of strife, as the great hymn, Joyful, Joyful, declares so triumphantly. A few ver verses earlier, speaking of the evil forces in the world, John writes that you, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. When you're tempted to despair, remind yourself of that. And here I use the words of the King James, that greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Or as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We don't need to live lives of defeat. Indeed, Romans 8, 37, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. If you're still not convinced, consider Philippians 4, 13, in which Paul declares that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Moving on, we are possessors of eternal life and protected. I give them eternal life, says Jesus, they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. Now we can get into debates here about whether a person who has once trusted in Christ can lose their status. And there are troubling scriptures, uh, especially in Hebrews, that warn of the severe punishment deserved by those who, it says, have trampled underfoot the Son of God and have treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that once sanctified them, and who have thereby insulted the Spirit of grace. Still, whatever our view on what's called eternal security, that tells me that I need to keep trusting God's work of grace and keep walking with him. Because if you're doing that, if you're trusting in Jesus, 
no one can take away your status in him. See, we are protected with God's peace, another thing that flows from our identity. As Paul writes in Philippians 4, the peace of God which transcends, which goes above all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Something else, and this is amazing, is it not? You and I are saints. Another word related to that is sanctified, which means to be made holy. Do you doubt that? Ephesians 1 verse 4 says that God chose us in Christ before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. A bit later he says we are sealed with the Holy Spirit, who is the deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. Scripture is clear. A saint is not someone who's been elevated to some higher rank in heaven. A saint is one who has been sanctified, made holy through the work of God's Holy Spirit who indwells all believers. That's why each of Paul's letters are addressed to the saints, uh, the sanctified ones, the holy ones, the saints at Rome and at Corinth and at Ephesus and so on. That's why Paul could write in Ephesians 1 verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. That is my prayer for you today, that you might know the hope that is yours as one of God's saints. See, and this is another part of your identity. You are a citizen of heaven. That's what Philippians 3 verse 20 says. Ephesians 2 6 says you are seated with Jesus Christ in the heavenly realm. A few verses further on it says we are no longer strangers and aliens but fellow citizens with the saints and are members of God's household. You're also the earthly temple of God's Holy Spirit. First Corinthians says that. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? Let that sink in. We're also living stones. In 1 Peter 2, 5, Peter declares that you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And this house comprised of us, the living stones, is solid. The foundation is secure because, Ephesians 2, verse 20, you are built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. Fact is, as Paul writes a few verses earlier, you are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We're also a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. Another scripture says that. So that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Revelation 1 verse 16 says much the same. He, that is Jesus, loves us and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to, to serve his God and Father. Friend, do you wonder about your worth or your purpose? There is no greater purpose than to be called to serve the Almighty God of the cosmos. And how do we serve him? As God's co-worker in whatever calling we find ourselves, 1 Corinthians 3.9, as Christ's ambassador, 2 Corinthians 5.20, representing the King of all kings to whomever we meet, and as ministers of reconciliation, inviting those estranged from God to come to know him. There are so many other descriptions of, of us as Jesus followers. Jesus' friends, branches of Christ, the true vine, chosen and appointed to bear fruit, as he says in John 15. The one who identified himself as the light of the world said that we are also the light of the world and the salt of the earth. Paul tells Timothy that we're called of God from the beginning of time. He called us to be to a holy life, not because of anything we had done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace, he says, was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Other scriptures say we're hidden with Christ in God, that we possess the mind of Christ, that we're complete in Christ. You know, that list goes on and on and on. And I have to confess, I find it hard to stop. I don't really know where. I should, but I will. I need to. 
with one last all-inclusive statement of who we are in Christ. And that is that you and I are dearly loved of God. I hope you've grasped that today. That's the bottom line in all that I've said, that you are dearly loved of God. You are the apple of his eye, the object of his affection, the one on whom he dotes. He can't do enough for you. Everything he has is yours. He even gave his one and only beloved son for you. So please know that in Christ, God has accepted you and values you highly. No matter what the devil, the father of lies, and the accuser of the brothers may say. No matter what anyone in this world may say. As I said at the outset, God says you have infinite worth. He loves you so much. And as amazing as your identity uh, is, as I've already described it, let me also remind you that one day, a great party is going to be thrown in heaven for the Lamb of God, for Jesus, and for his beloved bride, for you and me. That's when the scripture says we're transformed. We don't know what we will be like, except that we will be like him. Wow. Over 50 years ago, Johnny Erickson Tata became a quadriplegic confined to a wheelchair. In her book, Heaven, Your Real Home, she writes this. Somewhere in my broken, paralyzed body is the seed of what I shall become. The paralysis makes what I am to become all the more grand when you contrast atrophied, useless legs against the splendorous, resurrected legs. I am convinced, she says, that if there are mirrors in heaven, and why not, the image I'll see will be unmistakably Johnny. So much so that it's not worth comparing I will bear the likeness of Jesus, the man from God. Given all of this, as Francis Schaeffer puts it, how shall we then live? And the answer is victoriously. How can we live any other way? Well, at this time, we want to share a very powerful video with you, the Father's Love Letter, after which I'll have a closing prayer. Just before the video, I do want to give you a heads up that I'll be leading us in communion next week. So you may wish to plan ahead to have bread and crackers and uh, bread or crackers and juice or wine available. The Father's Love Letter. The words you are about to experience are true. They will change your life if you let them. For they come from the very heart of God. He loves you. And He is the Father you have been looking for all your life. This is His love letter to you. My child, you may not know me but I know everything about you. I know when you sit down and when you rise up. I am familiar with all your ways. Even the very hairs on your head are numbered, for you were made in my image. In me you live and move and have your being, for you are my offspring. I knew you even before you were conceived. I chose you when I planned creation. You were not a mistake, for all your days are written in my book. I determined the exact time of your birth and where you would live. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. I knit you together in your mother's womb and brought you forth on the day you were born. I have been misrepresented by those who don't know me. I am not distant and angry, but am the complete expression of love. And it is my desire to lavish my love on you, simply because you are my child and I am your father. I offer you more than your earthly father ever could, for I am the perfect father. Every good gift that you receive comes from my hand, for I am your provider and I meet 
all your needs. My plan for your future has always been filled with hope because I love you with an everlasting love. My thoughts toward you are countless as the sand on the seashore, and I rejoice over you with singing. I will never stop doing good to you, for you are my treasured possession. I desire to establish you with all my heart and all my soul, and I want to show you great and marvelous things. If you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. Delight in me and I will give you the desires of your heart. For it is I who gave you those desires. I am able to do more for you than you could possibly imagine. For I am your greatest encourager. I am also the Father who comforts you in all your troubles. When you are broken hearted, I am close to you. As a shepherd carries a lamb, I have carried you close to my heart. One day, I will wipe away every tear from your eyes, and I'll take away all the pain you have suffered on this earth. I am your Father, and I love you even as I love my Son, Jesus. For in Jesus, my love for you is revealed. He is the exact representation of my being. He came to demonstrate that I am for you, not against you, and to tell you that I am not counting your sins. Jesus died so that you and I could be reconciled. His death was the ultimate expression of my love for you. I gave up everything I loved that I might gain your love. If you receive the gift of my son Jesus, you receive me and nothing will ever separate you from my love again. Come home and I'll throw the biggest party heaven has ever seen. I have always been father, and will always be father. My question is, will you be my child? I am waiting for you. Love, your dad, almighty God. As I close today, I need to acknowledge that some listening to me just now may not have that relationship with Jesus that I've been uh, talking about all through my message. You haven't embraced the Father's love for you in Christ. If that's you, this may be your time to take that all-important, life-transforming step of committing your life to Jesus. I invite you, I urge you to do that. When you do you take that first all-important step to becoming all that God intended you to be. Will you do it? If you'd like to, why don't you just pray along with me right now? I guarantee your life will never be the same. Let's pray. Loving Lord, Father God, I want to be that sort of person for which you created me. I accept that you know who I am what my gifts are, how my life can count for you, something meaningful and lasting, and where I fit in your forever family. I accept that Jesus died on the cross for my sins to reconcile me to God because of his great love for me. Thank you, Jesus, for dying in my place. I am truly sorry for my sins. I turn from them. And as I do, I accept your forgiveness. Come into my life 
and begin the process of molding me into all that you planned that I should be and directing me in the path that you have chosen for me. Please give me the courage and strength to live worthy of your love and to follow wherever you lead until that day when I shall stand in your presence and know all things fully, even as I am fully known. I pray these things in your precious and holy name. Amen. Now in the words of Revelation chapter 1 verse 6, To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen.